Welcome, my friends, to Sinful's Horror Stories. I want you all to get comfortable, sit back and relax, and stay sinful. I'm a 22-year-old female, and I attend university with a large campus. There are two bus stops, one newer one near the main part of campus, and the older one at the end of a parking area by the vet buildings. I usually use the new one, but I used to have a lecture that ended at 6.30 p.m. The lecture was in one of the vet buildings, and I didn't want to walk up the hill to the new one when the old stop was closer. That almost got me into a world of trouble. It was already dark and starting to rain. The stop didn't have any shelter back then, and it wasn't well illuminated, as there was only the one street light off to the side. I was standing under my umbrella in the near darkness praying for a bus, when lo and behold, a bus. As the bus got closer, my heart sank. Not in service was flashing across a sign on the front. It was going to just go past me. The driver must have seen how miserable I looked, or maybe he realized how dangerous it was when I hadn't. Either way, he stopped. He pulled over and told me to hop in and not bother tagging on so I even got a free ride. I hopped off at the station thanking him profusely and made my way home none the wiser. The next day I told my friend what happened and she told me this. About five minutes after I got on that bus, a girl was attacked by her car, 10 meters from where I'd been standing. She luckily got away and ran back to the vet buildings and the guy took off. I don't know if they ever caught him. I have to wonder if that guy was there while I waited for the bus, and if that angel of a driver hadn't picked me up. Would I have been attacked instead of her? That thought chills me to the bone, and I don't use that stop unless I'm with a friend now, and certainly not after dark. The story is not personally mine, but my cousin's. I don't know how much of it's true given my cousin exaggerates a lot of things. Their names and locations have been changed to protect them as minors. My 13-year-old cousin Anne and her sister Lydia went on a summer camping trip for their youth group. Anne, Lydia, and multiple other girls shared one cabin, while Anne's best friend shared another. Every night after the campfire, Lydia and Anne would sneak over to the other cabin. This obviously wasn't allowed given they were young girls, wandering around with no chaperones. On this particular night, it was past curfew and keep in mind, they're breaking all sorts of rules. Anna and Lydia got into the cabin okay, and the girls started talking about whatever teen girls talk about. There were six bunks in the room, all against the door to floor windows. Anne was sitting on the top bunk while the other girls were sitting at the table in the middle of the room. Suddenly she heard what sounded like a person taking a picture, but not on a phone, on a real camera. Anne describes that moment as a bone-chilling experience, as she knew something was off, however she ignored it. She thought she was hearing things until it happened a couple more times, and all of the other girls soon noticed. Anne, being scared to get caught or told on, quickly shuts off the lights. She tells the obviously freaked out girls not to call anybody, and that she would figure it out. At this point, Lydia started crying, followed by the others. There wasn't curtains over the window. She could clearly distinguish three figures peeking in. Anne, at this point, was scared for her life, and dialed 911 into her phone, in case something happened. In retrospect, she should have called at that point. However, she thought it was a joke from some of the other kids. Lydia called the camp leader to come to their cabin. Once the leader showed up, they told him everything. At this point, the figures had disappeared long before the leader got there. He woke up all the other chaperones and they went searching around the property. The most chilling part was behind the cabin right under the window. There was four sets of clothing. They ranged in gender and size. They never called the police to investigate. They should have, considering these were young children, and children still continue to camp up in those cabins to this day. When Anne finally told her mom the story years later, she got the youth leader fired for his inability to make a police report. 
Now for some context. I'm a female and at the time of this story, I just turned 15. For some privacy reasons, I won't disclose my exact location, but I'm from a small, quiet village in England, where everyone knows everyone, and the elderly come to retire. The village has a few shops that barely last months without closing, and reopening is something new. As you can imagine, after 8 p.m., the village becomes a ghost town. One night after 9 p.m., I was with my older sister, we will call her Tanya, and her friend Lisa. We all wanted to go have some drinks with my older sister Kay. She lived about 50 minutes away. Me being young, I of course begged them to let me come with them. My parents never being around meant I could do pretty much anything. I wouldn't be drinking alcohol. I wanted to go out late and feel like a big kid. All three of us were under five foot six, so we all looked fairly young along with my sister and her friend were in their early to mid twenties. Now, while my sister went into the store to get alcohol for them, Lisa and I sat on a bench under a rather dimly lit light next to the road. Lisa was noticeably quiet, quietly nudging me telling me there was a man watching us. She then turned her back to him so I could face his direction without making it obvious. There stood about 10 meters away from us, a tall slender man wearing what seemed to be all black with a beanie. I couldn't make out much as the only light around was the one we were standing under, but he was bald. What's scary about that you may ask? The man was looking into an abandoned shop window, not moving just staring into the window with his back facing us. The type of glass on the window was frosted and blacked out. You couldn't see inside but you could see reflections. That light we sat under made it perfect for him to see everything around him, including us. There is something truly sinister about someone staring into a blackened window in the middle of the night right at you, watching. Why I thought. I felt sick. Tanya comes out the store cheery with her alcohol in a grocery bag and we swiftly make our way away from the man towards our destination. Once a little bit away from the man, still not looking back, I tell Tanya that there was a man watching us, as I said. Lisa whispered that he was following us. I could hear panic in her breath. Let me explain the area. There are two paths that separated by a small river. You could easily jump to the other side without issue. I know this as I used to do that exact thing with my friends. The two pathways meet at the end, and you can either take a right and go through a shortcut through a large unlit field that would take us straight to Kay's house, or a left which meant you stayed on the road with houses around us. This route would take another 15 minutes so into our journey. The path we were on is next to a lit road with houses. I turned around and saw the outline of this slender man. He was walking on the right side of the river, in between the trees and the dark. My heart was in my throat. We began to speed up and so did he. My sister Tanya, being the more outgoing type, takes out the glass bottle out of the bag and grips it in her hand. She was ready to swing if he tried anything. We noticed he took cover behind the trees which obscured our view. My heart pounding, all I could hear was the deep heavy thumps of my heartbeat in my ears. It was deafening. We moved into the middle of the road to distance ourselves from the man further. We were nearing where the two paths would meet. If we took a right and went through the unlit field, we would have to cross his path, putting us in the dark, alone from any sign of civilization. We needed to make a break for it. We shouted to each other to run, and I gripped onto my sister's jacket and ran left with them following the lit road. We ran not looking back. I could feel my throat burning with each rapid painful breath. When we got far away from the path we stopped to gather ourselves and look back. He was gone. Relief washed over me instantly. We began walking the longer route to Kay's and discussing the recent events. Soon enough I felt a knot in my stomach as I realized we still had to pass a side exit to the field. I mentioned this to them as we neared it. Our anxiety raised and my sister pulled me on the outside, protecting me from the field with the bottle in her hand. 
Fortunately, we passed and saw no signs of the man in the field, although it was extremely hard to see anything, just a field of inky darkness. Once we passed, I realized I had held my breath the entire time. I felt like I was about to vomit from the lack of air and adrenaline. I managed to get my breathing under control and we quickly made it to my sister's house safely. We explained to Kay about the man and she shook us off. She told us we were overreacting, which is classic Kay. Nonetheless, we had a good night, but we still had to walk home. As you can imagine, the walk home was very much filled with fear. Thankfully, we saw no sign of that man again. I still live in the same eerie village. Now nearing 20 years old, I wonder what intentions this man truly had for us. So it's the summer of 2013. I'm 21 and just finished my junior year in college. The second week of August, a group of my friends and I go on an eight-day camping trip. It's seven of us in total, four guys and three girls. We're camping in a semi-remote campground in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was a large campground, but very few other campers were there. There were a few filled sites near the front of the campground, but we purposefully requested a site in the back corner. We were completely by ourselves. During the trip, we planned a whitewater rafting trip for one of the days. We were hiking Mount Washington towards the end of the trip and thought maybe we'd do one to two small hikes. With one to two days of just chilling by the lake at the campground, We also planned on doing plenty of drinking during the evenings. The first couple days of the trip were fantastic. Whitewater rafting was a blast. Everything is going great. It's the evening of our third day. We have a roaring fire going. We're all just hanging out at the campsite drinking and fucking around. It's 9.30 p.m. when a disheveled looking man walks past our site. His clothes are kind of worn out messy tangled hair. He looks maybe in his mid-forties. This isn't weird though. We all just think it's another camper doing a late evening stroll around the campground. About an hour and a half later, we see the same man walk past our site in the same direction. This time he's walking slower, almost with a bit of a limp. We're all pretty drunk at this point. I think one of us might have yelled something out to him but he just ignores us and keeps walking. Mildly strange, but still is probably just someone who wanted to take a long walk. We wrap up the night around 1.30 or 2 a.m. The fire's dying down and we head back to our tents. I usually love sleeping while camping. I usually find it extremely peaceful, but for some reason I was having trouble falling asleep this night. I get up to take a piss in the woods. And when I do, I see a faint light maybe 50 to 75 yards ahead of me. It looks like a dim flashlight or something similar. I decide I want to go investigate. I go back to the tent. One of my other buddies is still awake, and I tell him about it. We get up to investigate, and when we do, the light is no longer on. Feeling a little unnerved, I shine my flashlight around the woods a bit, but don't see anything so I decide maybe my eyes were playing a trick on me, and I head back to bed. Sometime later that night, I wake up to a terrifying scream. It was Sarah, one of the girls we were camping with. I jump out of my tent as quickly as possible and nearly run into her as she's running back into our site. She's still screaming. She screams that there was a man standing in the middle of the woods. Now her whole party is awake and freaking the fuck out. I try to calm Sarah down enough to get her to explain what actually happened. She says she went to pee in the woods and saw the man from earlier, just standing 15 feet from her, not moving, like a statue. We're all freaking out, yelling, screaming, making a giant commotion. I'm internally freaking out too, but try to calm everyone down enough so we can actually do something. We obviously decide to get the fuck out of Dodge. We frantically take down our tents, basically just ripping the poles out, throwing everything into the back of our cars. Then we sped out of there. It's around 4 a.m. 
We're in two separate cars and decide to just drive away from the site, clear our heads. Eventually at around 5.30 a.m., we find a small diner that's open, decide to head in for some breakfast. We all have different theories about what the hell just happened. Some of us think we just ran into a homeless guy who was camping out in the woods and was surprised by us. Some of the girls think maybe he was purposefully stalking us. Either way, obviously none of us are comfortable staying at that campground again. I head back to the front desk of the campground with two of the other guys. We explain what happened and the guys at the front desk actually seemed to believe us, but said there was definitely no other campers currently that fit the description of the man. They were insanely nice about it though, and actually refunded most of the remainder of our stay, which was astonishing. As a group, we decided that fuck it, we're not letting one freaky guy ruin our trip. We find another campground a good ways away to stay in. Fast forward two days. We're hiking Mount Washington. We get up really early and get to the mountain around 7.30 to start hiking. We're a little over halfway up the mountain when we see the very same guy hiking down. This time he looks much better. His hair isn't crazy. His hiking clothes are relatively clean. We're all just frozen. A few of us let out a surprise scream. He just strolls past us with this massive grin. Luckily, there are enough hikers nearby that nothing could really happen. We decide to continue hiking up anyways, since he is headed in the opposite direction, and we hope we just never encounter him again. We did finish the hike and luckily didn't see him. After that, we did decide to cut the trip a couple days short. Looking back on it, we've all come to the conclusion we're likely being stalked in some way. If it was just some homeless guy in the woods near the campground, the hell is he doing hiking down Mount Washington a couple days later? It was a pretty unnerving and bizarre experience for sure. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Please be sure to leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe for future content. Continue to email your true scary stories to thesinfulsavant at gmail.com. That way you can have your stories featured on an upcoming video. I hope everyone's doing well and having a great weekend. Until we meet again, stay sinful.